Hello, welcome again to another episode of the Persuasion Lab podcast. I'm your host, Moeed Amin, and the goal of this show is to help business leaders, uh, sales professionals, you know, whatever career that you're in, to be able to level up your life and your career to the next level. Most of what we do talks about persuasion and all the facets related to persuasion, but it's not just about that. You know, we will cover things around your health, around your finances, uh, around your behavioral psychology, even things around business and how you can take your business to the next level. So that is what we're focused on today. So today I'm, um, I, I'm very privileged to um, welcome our guest and, and he's known as the transitions guy. And the reason why he has that name is that he is known for delivering results uh, and is very passionate about helping people um, you know, attain the meaningful change in both their personal and professional lives. In my view, those things are interconnected. So it makes sense that he does both as well. Um, he's received um, over 32 major coaching awards. And actually, if you, looked at, if you look at his LinkedIn profile, you will see that there are 136 feedback, positive feedback and recommendations about him some of which actually come from other coaches. So he seems to be the coaches to the coaches, and that's how good he is. So really looking forward to the discussion that we have today. So uh, please help me welcome Peter Bulka. Peter, welcome to the show. Thank you, Moen, and thank you for those really kind words. Really appreciate it. Well, it, it, it seems, it seems, uh, it seems well-deserved, <laughs> and it's, all, it's, it's uh, you know, 136 recommendations is not done, something to be sniffed at, so clearly something is being done right. Um, so really, really looking forward to our discussion today, and um, let's kick off with the first thing, which is, I mean, you essentially help people scale up to the next level. Yeah. And can you share with our viewers and listeners, what, what does that actually mean? Again, scaling up means different things to different people. But it's actually allowing businesses, helping businesses, and I would call it sustainably grow their business. They normally grow it maybe 10, 20% minimum per annum. So it's it's not doing that uncontrollable scaling, uncontrollable growth where it's a mess. It's actually having a pleasant growth path that's both sustainable and manageable. Let's talk about the, the manageable um you know, and, and you've mentioned that earlier as well in another, in another way. What do you mean by manageable? Because surely, and you hear this with a lot of business leaders, particularly those in the tech industry, et cetera, you know, they're looking for, you know, 200% growth, et cetera. But, but you're talking about manageable growth. Um, yeah. Tell us a bit more about that. What you tend to find is a lot of high growth companies, unfortunately, scaling chaos. Mm. So their revenue totally outscales their business structure, business processes, people, etc. So what it is, it's, it's just one pot of chaos. And it can be a kind of a situation that burns people out. People perhaps don't enjoy the environment, they'll leave. They can mm. often let down customers. You can't guarantee, well, you can't say you can't guarantee. It's hard to guarantee consistency in chaos. And when you say chaos and you're manageable, I'm assuming you're talking about some of the usual levers and levers dimensions, such as, you know, the number of people that you have, the resources that you have, funding, et cetera. Are Absolutely. there any surprising, are there any surprising elements or dimensions to manageable growth? That, Not really. Uh, it's, 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 it's difficult. I mean, right now, when we're looking at a lot of the high scale businesses, the high growth businesses as we speak right now, yes, their order book's absolutely full, but they're spending forever trying to chase down the supply chain because many businesses are suffering from a huge delay in supply chain. I've got businesses right now that quoted three or four months ago. They're coming to me saying, okay, we quoted, but prices have gone up and we didn't factor that into our pricing structure. And they've already got contracts that are now loss making because they didn't have the right clauses in. There are so many different elements that there's companies out there that are scaling right now. They've got orders, but they haven't got the people to execute it. So I think when you're talking about that chaos, I mean, it's hard enough during normal times. But during times like this, there are so many more variables that need to be managed. It can be quite stressful 
not just for the entrepreneur themselves, but for the teams having to sort out the problems or be right in the middle of the problems. Okay. And we're going to come on to that, actually, because I, I really want to spend some time talking to you about you know, this, pro this possible next decade that we're entering of you know potential stagflation high interest rates you know what is that going to mean you know if it, if it goes back to the kind of 80s 90s style that we saw here in the uk as well as other countries so i'm going to come on to that the couple of questions i want to ask you first just to set the scene so firstly what is the biggest misconception that people have about scaling successfully well i think the biggest misconception is that it's easily done everybody wants to get into business and when i speak to people what's your goal of your business Oh, I want to grow. So people very often want to grow. But the question is, okay, what well, do you want to grow to? How do you want to grow? Those questions never come up. Or well, why do you even want to grow? I know plenty of businesses out there that don't necessarily grow massively, but make phenomenal profit and have a purpose for that profit. I think the misconception is, okay, you should always grow and that growth can be easy. No, that's the problem interesting is, that you say that. The Sorry. problem is you, you look at the press and the press will show you the unicorns, those businesses out there that are flying. And they, it's a bit like what social media has done for people where they'll look at other people's lives and think, oh, they've got the best life ever. How lucky are they? They look at these unicorns and they say, oh, these unicorns are growing. We need to be like a unicorn. Well, you don't necessarily need to be one. But it's that sort of pressure all of a sudden that we have to grow, we have to be big, and it's necessarily the best thing to do. Now, I, would, I believe that, yes, businesses should have growth, and your growth should always outpace inflation because costs are always going to rise. So you want to be ahead of that curve. But you don't want to grow at the cost of profit. And that's one of the big challenges. A lot of people scale and it costs to scale. And they end up growing broke, which is a big challenge. Growing broke. That's an interesting, that's, <laughs> that's an interesting way to describe it. And, and how, how do you advise business leaders to avoid falling into that trap of trying to compete with others and what they're hearing in the media? Because it is a difficult thing to avoid other than maybe just not watching the news or not reading the news. How do you advise business leaders to, to avoid that trap? I would say be clear about what you want out of your business. I mean, the majority of people out there in business are privately owned SMEs. And there's the challenge. You see, a lot of the stuff we see purported in the press is your blue chip companies watched by SME business owners. The reality is when you've got your own business, it normally is there to serve a purpose. Be clear what that purpose is. Be clear what you want out of your business. Be clear what you want out of your life. The nice thing about owning your own business is if you clearly define what goals you want to achieve in your life, then you can tailor your business to help you achieve those goals. So essentially you're describing the why. You know, what, mm -hmm. what, is, what is your why? And how does that drive you? And therefore structuring your business according to that why. So the, the, initial, the initial thought that came into my mind is, can that not easily become very selfish or self-centered on the founder's part? So as they scale the business, if their why is pretty selfish, then that may harm the employees that they hire as they scale. Possibly. I mean, at the end of the day, a good leader a good leader out there will treat their people well. Now, when we're talking about selfish, you may have an entrepreneur that doesn't want to scale massively and wants a standard of living. Mm. They want to be able to spend time on holidays with their family. They want to have experiences. And therefore, there's nothing wrong with them structuring their business that helps them have that. It doesn't harm the employee. I think the challenge is that most of the time, business owners harm themselves because they, they run a business for everybody else but themselves and therefore run their business in a stressed and unhappy manner. 
And if the owner isn't happy and motivated, I would say that's probably a lot more harmful to employees than being selfish in terms of knowing what you want and being crystal clear how to get it. That's really interesting. Can you give some examples of when founders have run the business for others but themselves? I'll give you an example. So you see it very often in generational businesses where they come in, they take over the parents. It's not really their passion. They find it's a sense of duty and obligation to keep it going. Mm. So they're turning up day in, day out, running a business that they absolutely hate. And they're looking after the employees because mum and dad told them, you've got to look after these people. And let's be honest, those people should have been gone a long time ago. They're not getting much money out of the business. So they're not getting that much in the way of reward. And they're just damn miserable. That's a great example. And a lot of people will say, okay, I need to look after my people. They won't make the difficult decision of getting rid of people because the business cannot afford it. They end up keeping everybody and losing everything because they weren't prepared to make or equipped to make the right and tough choices. Let's change tact for a moment and talk about something that we, we you mentioned earlier, which I think is going to be really important for everyone that's listening and watching this, which is you know, the coming macroeconomic cycle. Um, you know, this is a very, I'm not going to say very different or unprecedented because there may be some elements that are, but we, you know, certainly, certainly my, my parents and grandparents have gone through some of these things before. But this coming period of, you know, what seems to be stagflation, at the very least, what, it, what, what it's going to be is high interest rates or higher interest rates than what we've had in the last 12, 14 years. What, how is that going to impact businesses? And therefore, what, what does that mean to how business leaders are going to need to, how they're going to need to conduct themselves? Because it's a very different, very different period to what they're probably all used to. Yeah. For most people in business, they probably never experienced the 70s or early 80s. So it's all new. And all that we had the sort of GFC 0809, that seems to be like a walk in the park, a little picnic compared to what we're going through now. What does that mean for business owners? It means change. Fundamentally, it means change. I mean, you look at the government, we have to revitalize the high streets. No, we don't. Why do we have to revitalize the high streets? Let's face it, do you know why high streets are declining? Because people don't visit them anymore. The world has changed. And I think if we keep our legacy thinking, trying to hold on to the past, that's going to be the that's going to be the kind of behavior that will damage businesses. At the end of the day, if we're thinking things will go back, things never go back, things go forward. Now, what we need to start thinking is where are the opportunities going forward? And I think we're quite fortunate. If you look at today, the world of the internet, where in the 70s and 80s, it was kind of localized business. You were lucky if you were national. These days, we're, we operate in a global economy where we can operate global locally. So I think what we've got to start saying is to ourselves, the market is huge out there. Let's say that the UK may be suffering. Well, can we offer products or services to other parts of the world that are not necessarily suffering? Let's think out the box a little bit. We don't have to just keep doing what we're doing. There is so much opportunity out there. And yes, there's going to be industries that start to fade away. But as one industry fades away, new ones come in and take their place. So as an entrepreneur, we need to be looking for the opportunities, not necessarily the problems. Maybe if I challenge you on this, because everything that you say, in theory, right, sounds... Well, it sounds fair. It sounds it, it, it sounds mm -hmm. clear, but practically that can be very hard. I, I, I mean, I, I have a background in neuroscience, and and I know that after about twenty five, you know, the process of neuroplasticity, which is the fundamentals of change, etc., it, it's a gated process. It's a difficult process for a lot of people to do it. You don't have to be a neuroscientist to know that change is quite difficult. How do you advise people to make those changes that you talk about? 
particularly in an environment of high anxiety, high stress, which doesn't always lend itself to you thinking creatively and in the right way sometimes. You know, you're coming from a place of fear and pressure, which is kind of contrary to, to kind of what you're descri describing, which is around looking at opportunities. So how, how do you advise people to actually start to approach this process of change? Okay, get rid of the stiff British upper lip first and foremost. Yeah. You see, we've been brought up, the culture is, well, we've just got to battle through it. Well, it doesn't have to be a battle. Who says that you have to do this journey alone? You don't have to do this journey alone. I mean, today there are plenty of advisors out there. There are coaches. You don't need to have all the answers. I mean, you're going into a period of the unknown. It doesn't mean you're going to have to have the answers about the unknown. You've just got to have the right questions and the right people to ask those questions to. Start collaborating. Start making use of many other resources that are out there. If you suffer from anxiety, which so many people do, especially during lockdown, the whole COVID changed mental health, that's for sure. How many people out there actually said, you know what, I need help. I want to go and get myself a psychotherapist or a psychologist and I'm going to work through the challenges that I'm facing so that I'm better equipped to deal with them. Yeah. At the end of the day, we are the only species on the planet that can truly determine our future. If I chose today to commit to becoming a doctor, I could enroll into medical school, apply myself, and in four years' time qualify. Only species that can do that. So we have choice. It doesn't mean that choice is easy, but then we need to make a different set of choices. Find the people that can help you. I'm going to come on to, well, how, let, let's start that first. How do you go about finding the right people that can help you? I know it sounds like an obvious question. But I've spoken to so many business leaders or, or, or sales professionals out there. They know theoretically or in principle, they need to find people that will help them. But they struggle. They seem to struggle to be able to do so. And one of the things that I, I hear from people is, well, I, I don't know whether this person can actually help me or not. And I'm too afraid to spend the money or take the commitment to, to try it out. And there's there any, your problem. There any... There's a problem. Right. We're never going to know if that person is right for us. How often have we got a trade person round and they've sucked? They've been absolutely awful. Oh, yeah. But it doesn't mean that we're not going to get that job done because that job needs doing. So we'll go. And when we do find a good person we can rely on, believe you me, we hold on to them like there's no tomorrow, right? Hmm. We're not keen to let them go or anything. So all I would say is you may have to try a person. You may have to try two. I mean, do your research. I mean, you've got websites, you've got testimonials. You've got lots of different reference points you can choose to make a good decision. But the decision has got to be to commit to trying something. It's like accountants. Not all accountants that you end up working with are great accountants. Your first accountant may not be the right fit for you. But somewhere down the line, you'll find that right accountant. You've just got to keep looking. No different to hiring an employee. When you hire an employee, not every single hire is going to be a great hire. And in fact, a number of them could be quite bad, actually. But it doesn't stop you hiring. Because if you didn't hire people, your business would go backwards. Because there's always going to be some attrition in business. So I think the best way to do is to just do your research and try. And if it doesn't work out, don't be discouraged. A lot of what you've been saying seems to center around mindset. Yeah. Um, so I, would it be safe to assume that mindset is really important to this whole, all this discussion that we've had around scaling up, taking, taking yourself and your business to the next level? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And the reason for that is the mind controls the body. Mm -hmm. I mean, everything starts up here. Yes, you need to have a fit and healthy body to feed the mind. But you need a healthy mind to feed yourself, to feed what you do. If the mind's not quite right, 
then at the end of the day, the decision making isn't going to be right. And if you've got those limiting beliefs, and I'm sure people tuning in today know what limiting beliefs are, but if you've got a set of limiting beliefs, very often passed down through families, mm. you're never going to achieve your full potential. I always say that if you if you work out and you go to the gym and everything and you do all the exercise, do you spend as much time working on your mindset? Or do you take your brain to the gym and work on your brain as much as you do on your body? Because if you don't, then there's a big opportunity missed. Let's dive into that. And, and this may be a tough question to answer in a podcast, and this requires more of a session, but I've got to ask this. What are the principles or what are the levers or things that people should be doing in order to exercise and train and develop their mindset in the same way that you just described the analogy of going down to the gym and developing their body? Because it's, it's a topic that is talked about quite a lot. There's a plethora of information around there. Some of it are kind of, you know, paying lip service to the whole process of mindset. You know, I talk about mindset a lot when it comes to sales and the sales mentality and the sales approach because it's it's it can determine you can put you can train salespeople with all the skills in the world but unless their mindset is in the right place they won't apply those skills in the right way so what are some of the what are some of the critical things uh, that people should be doing in order to train their mind as much as they're training their body okay so that's a really good question so you know the saying, you are what you eat. Mm -hmm. You are what you consume as well in terms of information. So you've got to make choices. Do you want to consume stuff that feeds you and makes you stronger and helps you achieve your goals? Or do you want to consume information that's going to depress you? I mean, look, if you go onto social media and you've got comparison syndrome, and you're looking at what everybody else is supposedly achieving, and you're not, that's not going to fill you with the best positive mindset because you're going to always feel like an imposter and less than. If you choose to watch trash TV instead of perhaps saying, okay, I'm going to use this time to consume some good information that's going to skill me up, that's not going to help with your mindset. A lot of people get so frustrated that they went through school, didn't like school, and that's it. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna learn anymore. Well, the only person that you end up punishing is yourself. If anything, now is the time to start learning. And I, I try to avoid the news. Yes, I will watch snippets of news so that I'm sort of aware of what's going on. But how often do you put on the news and it's positive? I mean, they make their money out of misery. You don't have to partake in that misery. Bad stuff happens out in the world all the time. Ain't going to help you build your business. I think you're starting to read the stuff that's going to empower you. That's going to make you more mentally resilient. That's going to skill you up so that you can better deal with what life throws at you. That would be my advice, yeah. And you've also got to hang around the right people. If you're going to hang around with people in the pub that don't own a business and you're trying to share business ideas with them and they're the ones telling you that it can't be done, then that's not going to be good for your mindset either. If you're the only positive person and no one else is around you is negative, then perhaps you need to change who you hang around with. Because they did if you take the whole bell curve, people that are in a really bad place, they don't want to see people do well because that means that they're different to them. So they'll try and drag you down with them. So I think there's a number of different things that people should be doing to sort of make sure that you put yourself in the right environment for success. And mentally, that's really important. Sometimes you're going to have to just stay away from family because family can be toxic as well. So pretty much. So two, two things that I took out of that. Number one is stand guard at the door of your mind. Absolutely. Right? And, and what comes in, what comes in will affect, you know, how you think. And the second is, you know, be careful about the people you surround yourself, at least on a predominant basis, right? Yeah. Um, so I've got, I've got to ask this question. How do you, how do you kind of feed your mindset? What, what does Peter do on a day-to-day, week-by-week, month-by-month basis? So I've got a couple of things. So I've had a psychotherapist in my camp now, 
for close to 15 years. At the end of that, I am only human. And I will suffer from anxiety, stress, and all the things that we will go through. I have a person that I can rely on that will help me work through those things and make sure that I'm not consumed by them. I have a couple of coaches in my corner, four coaches at the moment, helping me with different areas of my life and business, keeping me on track. I've got a great set of, and I call them sort of virtual board of advisors. So they're not necessarily full time, but I have my board of advisors that keep me sane, that keep me sort of, if I'm thinking something, in my mind, it's a big thing, but they look from the outside in and see that's not such a big thing. They help steer me back on track. So for me, the big thing that I do is I have a great team, a lot of them extended, that help keep me grounded, keep me focused, keep me on the right pathway. And then I do a lot of reading. Now, for me, not necessarily physical reading, because I struggle with that, but I listen to a lot of audio books. I may watch different sort of video series. So I spend myself consuming content that I can learn from, content that will help me deal with the current predicament so that I'm not victim to what goes on out there. At least I'm equipped to deal with it. Don't get me wrong, I don't always get it right. But I stand a better chance than a lot of people because I've done that work. So, I mean, in terms of that, it's, it really is my environment I work on massively. And that's both physical and people. So just, just a quick question on, on the board, the virtual board you mentioned. Is that board of advisors for your company or for yourself? Or actually both? Do you see them as one of the same? Both, actually. Both. Because I think there's so much crossover hmm. between... I mean, before, in the 70s and 80s, there was this really hard line between work and personal. But then you look at social media and everything, everything's just been blurred. So it is one. And they often cross over. So it's just having the right people around me to help me. That's the only way I look at it. Who mm. do I need in my life to help me? And I never used to have that mindset of being helped. Because when I was in corporate, that was a huge weakness. Don't ask mm. for help. That makes you weak. So I needed help to get over that as well. What changed? What, what changed at that period where you transitioned from you know, seeing I it as corp- weakness? I left that corporate, I left corporate, and I knew that I wasn't moving to where I needed to move. Yeah, I was stuck. And it wasn't a talent issue. I knew that. But I knew that not everything was right. I wasn't happy in myself. I knew that perhaps being in a corporate environment had affected me. And I needed to be able to move on. So I needed help in moving on, moving from one life to a new life. So that was really what the decision was about. How do I, how do I not be anchored to my previous life? So it was letting go and everything, not looking at what past opportunities could have been, but what future opportunities can be. And that took me a little while to work through it. Yeah, it, it's interesting and, and in some ways comforting to hear that you went through the same should we say challenges, you know, where, you know, you were stuck, maybe you were doubting yourself, it wasn't going to plan, things, things that a lot of us go through. But it seems reassuring that you went through that, right? Because often we see people that have achieved that success. And we forget that they are human beings at the end of the day, they have the same feelings, the same concerns, the same insecurities, um, same doubts, and have gone through that. Um, and, and I've gone through that and come out of that. So it's reassuring to hear that, you know, you describing that you've been through that before, because a lot of people I speak to are hesitant about seeking people because they don't want to fear, they want, they want to feel inferior. They almost feel as if those people probably didn't go through that in the same way that they did. I'd be very surprised, Marita, if no one went through a heap load of crap during lockdown. I lost 70% of my business overnight because it was international. I mean, if that's not enough to start keeping you up at night, I don't know what is. 
and the uncertainty around that, even and the whole thing around being displaced, all of a sudden not being able to have those freedoms taken away from you. Of course, they all bear on the mind. I know so many people that found the whole lockdown process tough. Whereas having the people around you to work through, that's a great example of working through. And who knows, something like that will come again. But once you work through it once, I wouldn't say it's necessarily easier the next time around, but you're better equipped to deal with it. No, that, I completely agree. And, and how, and, and the, I appreciate this is going to be different for different people. And we go back to, you know, what you described right at the beginning, which is, you know, you've got to understand your why and, you know, what you want out of this. So it, I, I, the question I have in my mind is how much time should business leaders, whether you're entrepreneur or, or a leader of a function like sales or finance or HR, whatever it might be, how much time should you spend working in the business compared with working on the business? It's a great, listen, that's a really great question. Let's look at it slightly differently. If you go to the gym and you want to get that really athletic, muscular physique, well, if you just train once or one hour a week, it's probably going to take you a couple of decades if you ever get there to get that physique. Whereas if you apply yourself and you're training three or four times a week, you've got a great diet and you're highly committed, you'll get there a lot quicker. It's no different to working in or on your business. If you work on your business just a couple of hours, yes, there's going to be a benefit to the business. Of course, if you work on your business far more, then of course you're going to have a different set of results because you're doing the, the work of a business owner. Because it's never the job of a business owner to work in the business. The job of the business owner is to learn to structure the business so it can run without them. If your business cannot run without you, and heaven forbid something happens to you, and you're incapacitated, the chances are your business is finished. Well, that's neither fair on yourself, your family, or your employees. So you probably owe it to yourself, your family, and your employees to structure the business to make you redundant, because then you know it can function and grow without you. And that would, for me, be the job of the owner, the entrepreneur. Mm. No, I love that. I love that. And that makes complete sense. So what about, what about those people who are kind of just starting out, right, where it's just them right now, maybe one other person? And right now, I would study as much business as you possibly can. Go and find yourself a mentor. Go and learn very, very quickly. Find someone to be your catalyst to learn and grow. Because you can do it the other way where you learn from your mistakes. That will slow the whole process down and cost you a lot more money in the long run. That's how most businesses learn, though. They learn through mistakes because they only know what they know. So my advice is always go and find out what you don't know. Go and speak to people that have done it. Go and speak to the people that know how to do it. Learn from them. So I, I get that. But my question was more around how much time should those individuals spend on working on the business versus in the business, right? Because at that early stage, they're in the business. I mean, people use the term hustle and grind. I don't really like those, those terms, but you know, they, they're, they're working hard to grow the business to a level where they can start to scale and hire more people, whether that's funding or whether that's doing so organically, right? And bootstrapping. So in those circumstances, Peter, how, what do you advise individuals, solopreneurs, how should they be spending their time working in the business versus on the business? You're probably gonna find you've got two jobs. Your day job's working in the business where you do all the execution and everything and you work, you work as a job, it's a job basically. It's not a mm. business. When you're working in the business, it's a job. So you'll do your job during the day or night, depending on what the business is. And then outside of that, you need to work on the business. So it's actually saying, okay, well, you can't, if orders need to get out and you're the one doing it, well, you've got to do it. But then you've got to have the discipline to say, okay, in the evening, I may not watch TV, 
I may dedicate two or three hours and I'll work on the business. Now, is it fair? Probably not. Is it the reality? Yeah. Question is going to be, at which point do you want that freedom? If you don't put the time in and do the learning and working on the business now, it'll just take you a lot longer to get your freedom. And that's it. I love the I like what Jim Rohn said. said. Jim Rohn said something really, one of his quotes I love, work harder on yourself than you do on your job. Yeah. And, and this is the principles in it, work harder on yourself. So if you're doing your job, then work harder on yourself outside of those hours. So, uh, yeah, Peter, I mean, what you said around discipline was really resonated with me because as a solopreneur, it's very easy to get caught in emails, you know, working in the business, marketing, all the stuff like the, the massive to do list that you'll have rather than working on the business. So I think what you said around there around discipline was uh, was really, really valuable there. Uh, and, and it does take that discipline to make sure you know, and say, say to yourself, look, I know I have all these other things, unless they're urgent, you know, if I don't deal with this and do this every day or frequently, then I'm going to be stuck in, it's stuck in the cycle for the next 10 years, 15 years. And I probably never get out of that. So that, that really resonated with me because I've, I've been through that, right. I have to say, so, um, and I wish I, I wish I had that discipline a lot earlier. Um, I so think, thank you for sharing that. Right. I think one of the big challenges there as well, is people convince themselves that answering the emails and doing all that stuff outside of working hours is working on the business when it really isn't. They convince themselves, yeah, but I'm doing work on the business in the evening. No, they're still working in the business. You're just doing it from a different location. It's making sure you're doing the right things on the business in that time. And so just to clarify for our listeners and viewers, can you give some examples of what, what's on the business versus in the business? So we talked about in the business being, you know, delivering orders, fulfilling orders, emails, all that kind of stuff. Can you give us just some examples about working on the business? We've talked about on yourself, like learning things, et cetera. What about on the business? On the business could be planning, doing some planning on the business, maybe a 90 day plan, working through your 90 day plan, looking at how, if you've already got a 90 day plan in place, What's progress like against a 90 day plan? It could be, well, I need to learn about marketing because I want to run a campaign. So I need to put some time aside to skill myself up so that I'm better equipped to making sure that if I do do a campaign, it stands a better chance of succeeding. So it's things like that. It could be working on the business, being well, part of the skill set I need is I need to start to become better networked. So you may, you may be going to networking events, maybe something like an IOD or Chamber of Commerce. Mm. They're just little areas. You may be saying, okay, there is an industry conference coming up. I need to get myself booked onto that conference where I can do some learning, networking. They're just a few areas. So these are new things to the next level. So to take your marketing example, if you need to learn things about marketing, like creating campaigns or landing pages, is working on the business also creating those landing pages as well? Or yeah. would that be termed as in the business, right? Well, that would be on the business because that doesn't fall into your day-to-day -day operations. They're just going to be activities that you're going to undertake in order to start scaling that business. Yeah, it makes complete sense. This, this, has, been, this has been really, really informative and interesting. Um, and I know that our listeners and viewers are going to feel the same. I have a couple of questions to quickly ask you. Number one, what, you know, apart from yourself, uh, what experts or authors or books would you recommend that our viewers and listeners should, uh, should acquire? John, it's probably too much of a big topic because I would say within each area, there are absolutely phenomenal experts. So I'll give you an example. If we're looking at marketing today, my go-to experts on marketing would be Donald Miller, Marcus Sheridan. They're, they're the two go-to for me right now. So I'd read all their material. I sort of subscribe to their podcasts. I consume all their content. If you're then still looking at vulnerability, emotional intelligence, I really love the stuff of Dr. Brené Brown. So I like her stuff. So I think it's finding 
the most relevant people in the subject matter you want to become expert in or you need to skill up on. So if we're looking at, so right now, I'll give you an example. We're looking at sort of inflationary pressures on a business. The expert out there is Herman Simon. He's the author of the book, Pricing, The Confessions of a Pricing Man. He also wrote a fantastic book called Hidden Champions. And that was a great book on strategy. So I look at the people out there that are leaders in their field. Jim Collins, good to great, phenomenal when it comes to discussing company culture. No one better to talk about core values than Jim Collins. So I think you've got to tailor your learning to the learning. What learning do you want to, then you choose the right person for that learning. Oh, that was really valuable. Uh, thank you for that. Um, and the other question is, if you think back to the younger version of Peter, what do you wish you would have done more or done differently in your 20s? So much. Oh, so much. Look, unfortunately, being young, hormones play a huge part. You think you know it all. But when you very much don't know enough, what do I wish I did? I wish I'd surrounded myself with people that, that encouraged me, that helped me to grow, than being people that I was in competition with. It was always chasing, it was always, oh, these these are my peer group. I need to sort of beat the shit out of them, pardon my language, so that I get the promotion. It was like a doggy dog, but it doesn't have to be that way. I wish I'd surrounded myself with people that knew how to bring the best out of me mm. and not manipulate me or not allow myself to be manipulated would be more the appropriate term. Thank you for sharing that, Peter. I think I think a lot of us can relate to that for sure. Um, how can uh, how can our viewers and listeners learn more about you and get in contact? I mean, best place to connect with me would be on LinkedIn. I tend to sort of hang out there the most, where I share stuff, read what other people are sharing. I mean, we've, we've got a couple of sort of free resources. So like yourself, I've got a podcast and YouTube channel, so you can go on there. If you go on my website, I've got loads of past webinars on specific topics, still all free. So just consume as much of the free content as you can and learn. Great. Well, Peter, I knew this was going to be a really, really good, um, really good uh, session and, and you didn't disappoint. I, I learned a ton and I know that our viewers and listeners will have as well. So thank you for uh, coming on the show. It's a pleasure having you. Thank you, Mohit, for having me. It's been a pleasure being on your show. So this is Mohit Amin signing out. Uh, if, if any of you would like to learn more about how to grow your sales, whether that's to scale or create an infrastructure in sales, or whether you want to become a, best, a better salesperson and navigate these much tougher times and continue to grow while others may be struggling, uh, do, uh, do contact me. The uh, link is in the show notes below, inquiries at proverbialdoor.com. Until then, stay safe and progress equals fulfillment. Thank you very much.